Good afternoon, and thank you so much for inviting me to this, uh, to this meeting uh, this afternoon. Um, I am a neuroscientist, and I do a lot of work with developing new brain diagnostic and treatment protocols. And I've worked uh, throughout the world. We're doing a number of projects in the Middle East now in uh, various countries in the Gulf. And uh, we have a lot of interesting types of equipment that are very portable and can be used via computer and satellite in many different countries. So this portable equipment can be extremely helpful in aiding the hospitals in doing diagnostic work specifically for uh, traumatic brain injury uh, as well as neuropsychiatric conditions like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so we're looking at both neurological and psychiatric types of uh, of uh, disorders. The, the way in which we look at the brain is a little bit different. We use neuromarkers. Typically in the US and Western medicine, uh, medications are given all the time. Whenever you, you know, look around at, a, at any billboard or advertisement, you see pharmacology and medication. Medication can be very useful, but also there are a lot of side effects from medication. And medications are not given in a scientific way. They're given more based on a general diagnosis than the specific functions of an individual's brain. So we have something called neuromarkers. And the neuromarkers are electrical, magnetic, and chemical types of assessments that we can do individually along with DNA and inflammation indexes so that we can understand your brain. The individual who's suffering from a brain injury, a brain disorder, depression, anxiety, or a host of other brain-related illnesses, uh, we, can, we can hone in specifically on what the electrical environment's like, what the chemical environment, what the magnetic environment is. And, through this, we can do these analyses, again, with very portable equipment uh, that, that can be used. We can train uh, individuals via satellite telemedicine. We can do a number of the work collaboratively through telemedicine uh, and working with uh, various uh, components of, of uh, medical uh, personnel. And I, I like the last point that was made about working with the youth because a lot of the youth can be trained on using computer technology and being able to collect data and understand this technology, uh, which can be extremely useful in developing expertise in, in, in some of these areas. And we can take young people who are motivated and interested in doing this and be able to teach them the, these computer technologies, which can be extremely valuable in, in this process and to work with various professionals. So, we have a lot of like pretty pictures up here. There are, there are portable equipment, uh, near-infrared spectroscopy, where we send an infrared beam into the brain. People don't feel anything. Everything is non-invasive. Uh, there are no chemicals injected in anyone. We can assess the metabolic functioning through oxygen consumption in the brain, these individuals. Um, we can do magnetic types of uh, uh, assessments of the brain and look at the rhythm of the electrical patterns and the magnetic patterns in the brain as well. Um, there are various kinds of signatures of certain chemicals that we can assess during this process. And these are all of these pictures are showing how each unique individual brain is organized in electric, magnetic, and chemical components. So the types of technologies that we've developed through clinical research over the past two decades is now able to be applied. Unfortunately, in the United States, with the strict FDA requirements, it takes many years to take new science to life and apply it. It can take us 10 to 20 years to get something that we know works approved and able to be utilized. So I think that there are opportunities where we can collaboratively work with various nations in Africa in newly developed technologies which are much more portable, much more effective, and less and much more cost effective as well, clinically and, and cost effective. So there's one technique here that we use. We, we we did a project with the US Department of Defense 
and privately with with colleagues of ours, uh, uh, Dr. Gene Lipov uh, and I. And this technique specifically, there's a lot of fancy equipment here, but technically you just need a needle and one piece of equipment. It's a 10-minute procedure, and we have a 90% recovery rate with people with post-traumatic stress. So individuals that are exposed to environments that are very harsh, that have had you know abuse, psychological, physical, sexual abuse, all the different types of abuse that have impacted on them greatly. Uh, many years of therapy and medications have really not helped a lot of these people. We've taken people who had 40 years, 45 years of trauma from war, from 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 you know uh, sexual uh, trafficking, etc. And within a 10-minute treatment protocol, we were able to improve 90% of these individuals through this technique. The technique costs about 1,500 US dollars to do. So it's a, it's a, it's a minimal type of, of technique. Uh, neurofeedback training. We can utilize these, these portable maps uh, and, and then put these head caps on individuals. And we can teach them through music, through art, through looking at videos to regulate the electrical activity in their brain while they're watching something that's interesting to them, we change the electrical environment of the brain in order to improve the brain by suppressing the activity we don't want to see and by enhancing the activity we do want to see. And this is completely a, a learning paradigm where individuals are actually able to train their own brains, called entrainment, with these portable type devices. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is a machine that was approved in the U.S. for depression. If individuals in the U.S. have depression and they're tried on two different medicines unsuccessfully, they can try this technique for six weeks and it has an 80 plus percent recovery for depression. This piece of equipment costs 50 to 100 thousand dollars and takes a lot of work to do. We have something called TDCS, which costs about $600, which does a very similar type of thing, a portable device, which can be directed to certain locations within the, the scalp and be able to make significant changes in the electrical system to improve depression in a very similar way to transcranial magnetic stimulation. So you have a $600 device and you have a $50,000 to $100,000 device. So the point that I'm trying to make is that many new emerging technologies that are available can help individuals with many different types of severe brain injury or other psychiatric conditions. The cost of these is much less than the, the typical cost that we spend on medications and other types of more expensive equipment. This last piece of equipment, very interesting, I'm working with an organization called Brain Sonics out of Los Angeles. I'm a consultant of theirs. It's a low intensity ultrasound pulsation. So we send in an ultrasound uh, pulsation into the center of the brain in an egg shaped structure called the thalamus, which is the major relay station in the brain. We select a certain location on the thalamus to re reorganize and reboot the brain and this has use for coma. We wo we've awakened about nine individuals with coma just with this technique and with an ancillary technique that uh, we developed through the International Brain Research Foundation. We've awakened over 125 individuals and we just finished a $6.4 million grant with the Department of Defense showing approximately 90% efficacy with the multimodal advanced care protocol and now we added uh, we're adding this new low intensity focused ultrasound pulsation. Again, this device, uh, th this particular device may cost $75,000 for one device, but you can treat hundreds or, or thousands of individuals uh, with brain injury, with stroke syndromes, with, co with epilepsy. We're looking at various applications for the new technologies. So I know that I have you know, limited time, I'm not sure, I'm probably out of time. Uh, oh, I'm, I have one minute left. Okay. So <laughs> if there are any questions, comments, or anything, I would be glad to, uh, to take them from you. And thank you again for inviting me to this uh, great conference today. Ma'am. So uh, can, can some of these things be worked with Alzheimer's? Yes.
Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Alzheimer's. Can, can, can some of these techniques be useful for Alzheimer's? We have a protocol. We develop brain maps, and our, our group has published this, where we can predict 10 years in advance who's going to develop Alzheimer's versus age-related cognitive decline. And then we can utilize these various kinds of interventions to either prevent or reduce the effect of the potential Alzheimer's. So instead of getting hit by a bus at 90 miles an hour, it may be getting hit by a bicycle at 10 miles an hour. So it would really improve the overall quality of life for individuals, preserving memory, you know, other cognitive functions, and emotional functions. And extending the life, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Ma'am? Yeah, um, thank you. My name is Dr. Marie Cortine. I am from Rwanda, survived the genocide over there. One of the stories I shared in my book, The Power of Social Media, is how I use social media to help our friends to speak out, to tell their story. Uh, we do trauma training uh, here in Rwanda. Oh, wow. And I have to recommend your work because these days, survivors of genocide that died in yes. trauma. Uh, last week, uh, there is this young girl, she's like 33, 32 years old, and she died because of trauma. She, she was feeling sick in her head. Yes, yes. She, 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 she was saying that her head, is, she feel pain, and she went to all medicals, they, they give her, they treat her, they give her medicine, but, but didn't help her, so she died. Huh. So, why I'm speaking with too much uh, emotion is because uh, to see the video of people who went to, to bury her body, they were crying, everybody were crying how she was nice in the community, uh, especially young people, because uh, there is no system you know, we have in Rwanda to treat trauma. Uh, genocide happened recently. There is no statistics uh, shows about helping people who are traumatized. I graduated at Columbia University, the program International Trauma Studies. It's a program designed by professors at Columbia and uh, NYU to use to use uh, uh, theater as a as a tool to help traumatized people to speak because they saw that there is no medicine they can give us to cope with trauma if they can help us to speak out. So I really recommend your work because I didn't know the way you explained. I saw that if this young girl who got recently passed away. If she had the opportunity to receive your medicine, your system, your technology system was going to help her with her brain. So my question to you, how can we make this available in Rwanda? How can we make it available? Yes. Um, I'm, well, we have the, we have the, the means to do it. Uh, I'm, I was just introduced to this group recently through uh, a, a colleague and friend of mine, uh, uh, Gloria Kin, so I would be very uh, humble to work, uh, to meet and talk with individuals to be able to figure out ways that we can facilitate implementing these things overseas. Okay. Okay, we will talk. Absolutely. I, by the way, at New York University is where we started a lot of the work here. I was a professor in the psychiatry and neurology department of the Brain Research Laboratory. And then from there, we developed this through some private, not-for-profit organizations to move quicker than the university pace. Because the universities are based on grants and, you know, they look to, to do research for the sake of research, but not taking the research and quickly implementing it into something usable for individuals. So that's why we made this shift. But I'm, I'm very interested in talking with you a little bit later. I don't want to take other people's time. Do we have time for one more question or are we out? I think we're out of time. So if someone wants to talk later, I'll be glad to speak with them. And again, thank you so much for the invitation today. Thank you.